Good evening and welcome to our fireside chat this evening. My name is Fred Rundle. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services for the Mercer Island School District. We're lucky to be joined by a number of uh, friendly faces for those of you in the Mercer Island community and maybe a few faces that are new to you and we'll do introductions here in a moment. Tonight is the first of several of these fireside chats that we'll be hosting as a school district. And the real intention behind these is to make sure we continue to outreach to all of our students and our families and certainly our staff about uh, new and exciting things happening in our district and also ways that we're challenging um, these unprecedented times due to COVID-19. So before we go to that, I, tonight I asked a number of you who are out there in the community to uh, submit some questions and we will be getting to those. And one that's been on the top of your mind has been really what does next year look like and, and how is the district preparing for the possibility that our schools in terms of the buildings themselves can't reopen next year and we're online or we're in some hybrid kind of format. So I want to welcome our superintendent Donna Koloski into the conversation this evening to share a little bit about what we're already working on and then we'll turn our attention to tonight's topic. So Donna, thanks for being here. Thank you, Fred, and thank you for all the attendees. I see the number is growing rapidly. So we see that there's a, an interest in getting information during this time. And we know that there are lots of questions pressing on everyone's minds about what comes next. And we want you to know that we are already um, working on that. We've established a initially a very small work group that's going to expand over the next few weeks that's really going to be looking at um, when we reopen, how are things going to look and how will we be prepared if we have to close school again, perhaps one school or, or perhaps all. So being prepared for that is um, foremost in our minds as we work through what does school look like um, in this new educational realm that we're in? Um, what is social distancing going to look like? How will remote learning um, adjust and adapt? Um, <clears throat> And what role will it play moving forward in our, um, our new, new school year? So we do not have all the answers yet, as does no district. We watch closely what um, OSPI, the governor's office, and public health is sharing. And as we gain that information, we use it to help us formulate our plans. We do have a commitment to put out information to our constituents as soon as we have the best responses and answers that we can. And we do know that everyone's um, anxious and worried about next year. And we have a commitment to putting that information out um, as we know exactly what we'll be able to do. Some of it might be these are the options as we work through the different scenarios of what may happen as we watch um, the science evolve during this time. So a lot of those questions about what will school look like specifically in the fall probably aren't going to be answered here tonight, but it sure is wonderful to see all of these experts here in this panel to answer many of your questions um, for your students and how they're going to move forward in their education. So again, thank you to the panelists for being here. Thank you to the attendees for listening in. And thank you, Fred. The fireside looks awesome. Thank you, Donna. Um, so our families and our students, whether or not they are preschoolers getting ready for that first year of kindergarten, or there are seniors heading off to college, um, something on everyone's mind is, will I be prepared for next year? Or will my students or my children be prepared for next year? And that's really the central focus of tonight's conversation. So I wanna bring in our guests to introduce themselves. We have a wide range of uh, voices and perspectives this evening and that was a very intentional choice wanting to make sure that we had all ends of the education spectrum uh, covered. So I want to begin with uh, our high schoolers uh, tonight and so joining us uh, Vicki Pucky. you want to introduce yourself Vicki and then I'll go around to each of our um, folks from there. So Vicki. Hi Vicki Puckett, principal at Mercer Island High School. And Henderson. One more time, Henderson with, with the, uh, there you go. Uh, Henderson Carlisle, Associate Principal from the high school. Susie. 
I'm Susie Brown and I'm one of the high school counselors. Dina? I'm Dina Via. I teach French at the high school and help run the language department. And Brian? Brian Hampsch. I'm a science teacher and instructional coach at the high school. And from our middle school tonight, Mary Jo? I'm Mary Jo Budges, one of the co-principals, Islander Middle School. And Drew? I'm Drew Klein, and I'm one of the counselors at Islander Middle School. And then joining us from our elementary, Chris? I'm Chris Coughlin Ray, and I'm a fifth grade teacher at West Mercer. And Lori? My name is Lori D. Stwolinski, and I teach kindergarten at Island Park Elementary. And from Learning Services, we have Andrews. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrews Ronser. I'm the Technology Director for the District. And from Higher Education, uh, I'm very appreciative that we have three members from uh, in state institutions with us tonight. First, Shannon Carr. Hi everyone, my name is Shannon Carr and I serve the University of Puget Sound as the Interim Vice President of Enrollment. And Western Washington, we have Cesar Mesquita. Good evening everyone, we went as noches, Cesar Mesquita, Director of Admissions up here in beautiful Bellingham at Western Washington University. And lastly, we have Glendale from the University of Washington. Hi everyone, my name is Glendale Teltulan and, and I'm an admissions counselor at the University of Washington. So a hearty welcome to all of you and thank you for being here this evening. Um, we want to just start off with just that broad question of, and we'll get into questions regarding specifics around college admissions and, and the college uh, entrance process for our seniors going uh, into college next year. And we'll talk about, um, you know, summer school and some other areas, but I just want to throw it out to the panel as a whole. Um, parents and students alike are concerned about their preparation for next year and um, whether or not I, I am, I've done, um, you know, biology and now I'm going to be doing Chem 1 and Phys 1 or I'm going to be going from kindergarten to first grade or, or whatnot. Um, how can we explain to our students or our parents about how they will be ready or not? Chris. So I'll start with fifth grade and what we normally do in fifth grade is we have a conversation with Drew Klein and a couple other counselors at the middle school just about this time of year. We're having those same conversations now, only we're thinking that our kids are going to be a little more fragile. And so those kids who we know will need support, we're actually planning on that and um, considering what we think they're going to need in the fall to make that transition. Most of us spend a lot of time on that transition this time of year. So it's, uh, we're punting. And, um, and I think what if, if I could say one thing, we know that if we ask for support from the middle school, we get it. And we don't just get it, we get it in spades. We really, they really are um, pretty thorough about what they ask us for. So this time of year, we're thinking the exact same thing is happening again. It's pretty nice to deal with. Brian. So at the high school. Brian, I think we lost your audio. Oh, there we go. Spent considerable amount of time focusing on what learning targets um, that are essential as we move forward. And so, and then also talking with the instructional coaches at both the middle school and the elementary schools, um, there, there really is a concerted effort to focus what the important learning targets are um, as they continue on for next year. And then we all know that at the beginning of next year, however things open up, that um, we need to capture what was learned and maybe what was, was um, sidetracked to try to really focus to get the kids back on track. Gina? I have to second what Brian said that I know in my department, um, just today we had meetings about um, what do you think um, they're going to need differently in the fall and what kind of review and things like that. And um, I think all departments, I can speak for all departments saying that everyone is going to pick up in the fall where they think um, we need, where we left off really. Um, they'll have learned some things online, of course, but we'll may have a more extensive review 
um, perhaps, and um, what Brian was saying, essential learnings are the key. And um, we know what um, is the core things that they need for college. And we know um, what's extra and um, extra is great, but um, we, we're all working as departments to come up with those um, core learnings and essential learnings that they need to, um, to move on to an AP class and a, high, and a, a college class. Mary Jo and Drew, do you want to talk about what are the conversations you're having in the middle school with respect to those incoming uh, fifth graders to sixth grade that Chris Cochran Ray was just talking about or sending those eighth graders on? Um, what's the conversation in the middle school? Well, I was first going to build off what Brian and Dina were both saying. Just um, our teachers are having those exact conversations, um, as Brian alluded to it, around what are those core essential standards. And I would actually say that our teachers are more aligned and more focused and more clear about what it is they want students to know and be able to do in this online environment than I think we've ever been at the building level. Uh, for whatever reason, this has driven some conversations that are very exciting and very dynamic and are working on behalf of our children um, in a super powerful way that I think will also translate as we come back into the building. So I just, I really, I can't speak to how powerful that those groups of teachers working together to plan and implement instruction is during this online time. Um, we are deep in transition. We just communicated with our fifth grade families today, um, our registration information and there were, I think, 11 videos or so that we attached with that that is typically information we would have given face-to-face -face or during an experience or an activity, but we're still working really hard to provide that same knowledge and information so fifth graders and their families can um, know what to expect and we um, are going to tailor our web experience and Drew can talk more about that. Um, it's really meant for that transition opportunity for our sixth graders so uh, I, they are going to be in really good hands as they come up and our teachers are going to be talking with our fifth grade um, uh, colleagues and our counselors will be armed with lots of information in preparation for that and the same goes with eighth grade. I just spoke with Jaina Dash today and they're just wrapping up their eighth grade transition meetings and the counselors at both levels were saying that they feel like the process was actually um, better than it's been in the past and that student voice was huge in the transition meetings and really they, their ability to advocate for themselves via this online environment was really impressive. So I think there are a lot of benefits. Um, while I can't wait to get back and I can't wait to be with people physically, there are some benefits to this. Drew, do you want to build on that in terms of what those sixth graders might expect coming in and, and web for those who may not know about web? Yeah, so I'm super excited. I'm lucky enough to be one of the web coordinators. And um, so we did our application process for our web leaders. So that's current seventh graders that will be eighth graders next year. And the enthusiasm and the applications were just so strong. So I'm really excited for these web leaders um, to be mentoring our sixth graders. And it's going to be um, so important this year with all the um, lack of you know contact we've been able to have or the different transition um, programs that we normally have and this is our 11th year with web um, and like I said I just don't I think it's the most important year um, a transition program is really important anyway um, which is you know why we work so hard every year to to make improvements um, but the web leader we may have frozen up a hello sorry there you go you're back okay i don't know where i got cut off but what i was saying was that um the sixth grade family should uh, explain you know that the eighth grade web leaders are so excited to make a difference in their life and um the sixth graders are really going to um have through transition program to the middle school whatever that looks like before the first day of school i'm not sure but certainly you know our plans hopefully are to continue with the program that we've had um where the web leaders are doing some group work and welcoming them and doing half of the day is web leaders and eighth graders um, so I'm just really excited to continue to be part of the web program and, and to be on such a strong team with web coordinators and our account administrative team 
Excellent, thanks. And before we go to higher ed, um, and I'll loop in with our, our uh, high school counselor at the high school, Susie, in, in higher ed, but I've got to go to the kindergarten. Um, Lori, I, I appreciate your sentiments in a previous conversation we had around um, now everyone for the first time is going to feel like they're the kindergarten teachers who students come in and you don't know what experience they've had and so you all your colleagues get the get the the kindergarten experience but um, what are you anticipating for the fall and, and what can you tell our parents I have no idea what to anticipate the fall <laughs> but I know that we are all getting to practice being flexible and resourceful and that we will continue to do so and as I was listening to this conversation, I was thinking, reminded of a book, The End of Average by, I think it's Todd Rose. And he talked about the jaggedness of people and those peaks of strengths and deficits make us the unique human that we are. And as we're all home and getting to experience one another's jaggedness as part of our family, <laughs> When we come back together, we're going to, uh, I think, better know ourselves. The kids are going to know themselves better as learners because they've had to be independent or very flexible with their substitute pandemic parent teacher. And I think there's going to be a bit of uh, maturity that comes with the kids that is going to be a new part of their jaggedness that they wouldn't have had before. And I think that's exciting. Um, in kindergarten, you know, you just never... All those kiddos have different experiences from Montessori to staying home with mom. And, you know, that's the magic of kindergarten is we become a community and we have forward movement together. And I think that is a gift that all of the teachers in our school district are going to have the opportunity to experience. And it's really, it really is a beautiful thing. It really is. Great. Thanks, Lori. And so let's go to Susie and, and to our high school, or excuse me, our college uh, admissions friends here tonight, um, thinking about those seniors who are going on to, um, to college next year. Um, what should they be thinking about or what should they not be worried about that they might be right now? Well, I think before even going there, I think it's really important. I think our kids, we've talked academically, everybody's addressed the academics. And I know with a lot of the kids I'm working with, I think whether they're in kindergarten or they're seniors, we also really need to look at that kind of social emotional piece. There's a lot of decisions. I know our higher ed people will address some of these, but whether they're going to university, to work, military, technical institute, it's in the fall, it's going to be a whole different world out there. Um, you know, our, our elementary kids, our middle school, there's a lot of anxiety. And I think that we all need to work together to really ensure that they understand that as corny as all these things sound on the TV and everywhere, we really are in this together. We're not isolated. It's not just us. It's the United States. It's the world. And so people are going to be looking at that. You know, their, their life is going to be looking differently. And I know that I'm getting lots of emails and, and higher ed folks about how they're going to be looking at admissions. And I've gotten things from the military. How are they going to be doing some of their recruiting? Um, so I think it's going to be another piece of this whole academic is also the reassurance that these kids need. We sometimes know that maybe a five-year-old needs it. We forget that a 17 or 18 year old also needs it. They're really good with their phones, not so good with tech outside of phones. I hear that a lot. Um, they're having issues just getting going and not being able to be as social. So that's gonna be a really, that's a real important piece too, is that whole social emotional for all of us, parents, teachers, counselors, everybody really, making sure that we're also addressing those needs. Great. Cesar, Shannon, and Glendale bring you into the conversation. Um, I could go ahead and start. I would just say that I think the biggest uh, concerns that have been addressed towards me via email or via phone has been um, with the incoming grades that students may be receiving over the next um, couple of months as the school year wraps up. Um, one of the biggest ones was pass-fail grades, right? 
Um, if I, how does that affect my transcript and how do we take that into account? And then also our college academic uh, distribution requirements, which are the bare minimum required uh, bare minimum of required classes that students would need to be admissible to the UW. Um, and I just wanted to say that uh, the University of Washington is being very flexible with students in saying that if you can't complete certain caters um, or if you do get a passing grade um, or if there were classes that you reported that you were going to take and maybe they have been dropped off of your class schedule, um, a lot of those things we see and we take into account um, the situation that's going on and um, we will not hold that against you when it comes to your overall application. So I just wanted to toss that out there first because I know that there are a lot of students who are fe uh, feeling very fearful about um, dropping certain classes or pass fail grades or not completing cert uh, certain requirements. Um, it's, we do it by case by case basis. It's a holistic process. And so the next thing I would just say is communicate with us. Um, I have a lot of appeals coming in. So if there's any students who are doing appeals to the University of Washington, um, make sure you're communicating with your admissions counselor, right? Um, if there's a situation going on at home because of the whole pandemic um, and you feel like certain grades maybe have been slipping over the last couple of months, address that issue with your admissions counselor. Um, do not be afraid to ask questions because sort of what uh, Susie was saying, just to piggyback off of that, we are here to support you and we're here to make sure that you guys have everything you need. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out. And I'll come back to maybe the grading piece here in a second. Uh, Shannon or Cesar, do you want to uh, jump in there around this broader question, though, um, about, you know, seniors who may be feeling like, gosh, I'm not sure if I'm even going to be ready now um, based on the experience this spring? I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, a couple of things. Uh, on the admissions side, we admit students largely based on everything that they've done up through their junior year and based on an understanding of their preparedness to be in a college environment because they're strong learners. And that, because of this, hasn't necessarily changed. So we're all aware that um, students can't, aren't finishing classes in the same way that they may have intended. We know that um, the that teachers are focusing on the essential learning components of classes and not all of the content. And so I just want to reiterate, don't worry about being behind all of your classmates are in this exact same boat. You are not going to be behind and the faculty on our campuses are ready and prepared for that. In addition, our campuses, like all of your teachers and your schools and you, have been um, evolving and growing over these last few months. Um, I feel like the last five weeks is actually about two years in terms of the workload. Um, but we're changing all of our transition programs. We know that, I mean, we all know about the summer slide, right? Where you come back uh, in September from taking the summer off and you think, God, did I learn all that last year? Um, and you need a little refresher. Well, the same is going to be true here and our faculty are even more ready for that. So we're setting up transition programs over the summer for all of the students who we know are going to be entering our classes to make sure that you can build connections with faculty, you can build connections with your classmates, you can get a sense of what being in the classroom will be like, even if it is in this remote environment. Um, we're thinking about orientation and what orientation programs look like if we have to be remote or in some sort of modified version of remote. I mean, our every intention at all of our colleges is to be in person um, for the fall. But we know that because of the size of our campuses or whatever the pandemic may still bring us, that we might have to have modified versions of that. So we're thinking about what does housing look like in that scenario? What does dining look like in that scenario? And we have our best people planning for your safety and wellness, but also for an enriching experience. And we've had at Puget Sound, our students tell us that in some ways the learning, and we heard it um, before this call, that in some ways the learning is even richer because the one-on-one -on -one connection with faculty and classmates is so much stronger in these Zoom and online formats. The other thing that I would just um, say is the two big things that we've heard a lot are students saying, should I defer if we're going to be online? Um, and two, there's a certain amount of financial insecurity that families are facing because of the economic impacts of this, um, of, of the pandemic. 
And so I would say that if you feel like you're in a um, financially insecure position when it comes to how you're going to make college affordable, much like Glendale said about the college requirements, also reach out to the campuses. We have financial aid counselors on our staffs who are ready and prepared to have that in-depth dialogue with you and to still continue to make this possible for you, even given your changing circumstances, because we know there is a lot of uncertainty. And the second thing I would say to that is, while it might seem scary um, and you have to make the decision that's right for you in your heart, I do think that all of us are adapting and growing and trying to create environments that will still be enriching, even if we're in some sort of hybrid or remote learning experience in the fall. So um, you have to do what's right for you, but I would say take a chance and um, make sure that you can start um, with your classmates as opposed to taking a break and making that hiatus of learning even longer. Um, and you all have individual circumstances, so I don't want to like force that point, but I do think that if you're just sort of scared of the risk, I would say take the chance. I am amazed and impressed at how each of our campuses is rising to the challenge and creating really dynamic learning environments despite um, this sort of Zoom format. Great. Thanks, Shannon. And Cesar, you want to build on any of that or go in a different direction? I'll leave it up to you. I, I'm just going to add a couple of things and perhaps, you know, cue us up to talking about the future for class of 2021, perhaps, you know, the juniors that are thinking about the, the, the you know, the, the future. You know, the future is now, yes, the fall 2020 cohort is important for us to think about their transition. So I'm gonna just also leave a, a very structurally important note here that uh, the College Board, the IB, uh, those are organizations that have modified their exams by quite a bit, but the college universities by and large have committed to maintaining the same level of awarding of credit based on last year's policy, not making any drastic changes, even though there is going to be a, a, a series of modifications to some of those exams, IB, it's not going to be doing any exams anyway. They're going to be using the grades from the transcripts. So colleges recognize that these challenges are fairly significant. So there are not going to be any changes associated with the awarding of college credit based on those scores. So for the students taking the exams uh, starting next week, good luck to you all. And again, those who are going to primarily going to be the, the, the juniors, but even some of the seniors who might be taking some of the AP classes right now. Before talking about the 2021, which I think it's going to be a good opportunity to talk about that, but for the, for the transition piece, no matter which student we're talking about, whether it's going to be at a grade school level or even at the high school senior, uh, each student is going to bring about its own backpack, right, of information. They're going to be bringing about a background academically. They're going to be bringing about a, a background, structurally speaking, a student who may necessitate an IEP, for example, different kind of supports, uh, support services financial support, food insecurities, uh, a social environment that is conducive for their best learning, as well as an environment that it will be conducive to affirm on the things that are important for the student to thrive and to succeed. The, the, at, at some point, the families will need to be making those determinations, right? That value proposition of what is it that I need to shore up with my student, my support network at the school, in my community now, to prepare them for success in whichever stage they were talking about. And it's going to be different for every student. I have a son, 395 GPA, got into UW, is going to study engineering over there. He's going to be fine on the academic side. Socially, he is really balking about what could an online experience be like and would he be living here in Bellingham and hanging out with his little sister? He would hate life a little bit if that were the case, but we know that that might be the right choice if we're talking about saving $12,000 a year in, in, in housing if the classes were primarily online, right? But even then, you talk about the experience that the colleges may roll out, socially speaking, for the students to engage in community building and team building and those kinds of experiences. So there are some important components there that uh, schools are going to be uh, looking at. I just queue it up. Just one the last thing over there before tossing back to you, Fred, is the the test optional movement that is very much growing across the country where increasing number of schools, UW, WSU, Western is on the cusp of making some announcements as well to basically removing the requirement of the SAT or the ACT for students applying for college for that fall 2021 cohort. In some instances, there's gonna be a spectrum of schools that are gonna still require the, the test 
all the way down to schools that are not going to not only require, not only omit that requirement, they're not even going to look at it, even if a student were to send it in. So effectively, it would be calling a test blind versus a test optional versus a test requirement spectrum. And that's going to be different for every school. So as juniors, as you embark in that process going forward, those are among the things that you may want to be looking at uh, uh, from here on out. So let's stay with that theme a little bit um, online tonight, as well as uh, others who had submitted before. They, they certainly had those questions around ACTs and T's. And, um, you know, there are some who have started to make those optional. And yet I still think students wonder, is it really optional or is that just kind of there? So Cesar, you helped clarify that a little bit. But if you can talk a little bit more, the three of you on ACT, SAT, but really then go into what our juniors and sophomores really be thinking about in terms of admissions. It, it seems like the landscape's going to change just like um, in, in the 12. Um, are there things, you, advice you'd give our juniors and our, and our um, sophomores, even our freshmen, our eighth graders who are starting to think about, um, you know, college or, or uni uh, life after high school? Yeah, Glenda, you first, or Shannon, yeah. I would just say, um, there, I think there's a public perception that colleges and universities are finding ways to keep students out, when in reality, anyone who works in admission, I think is trying to find ways to get call, uh, students in. Um, so the faces that are reading your application are the three of us on the screen, right? We're the ones reading your applications and we're looking at everything that you do holistically. We're looking at the whole picture of who you are as a student and we're offering flexibility in that format. I do think that we just heard about the movement towards test optional. Um, there's many schools that have been test optional for quite a long time, Puget Sound being one of them, but there are many that are moving in that direction because not only is it a way of being responsive to students, but it's also allowing us to look at other factors in a student's application that might show their readiness to be in a college environment. One of the anonym, uh, questions that came in anonymously was, um, how I said all students are in the same boat and you asked um, but how are you comparing that district to district across the country well the reality is because we do a holistic review we're able to look at the nuances of grading scales we're able to look at course ricker we're able to look at what is available in your school and what's not in the same ways that we do now we have students who come from schools where you can take 30 AP classes, and we have students who come from schools where you can take two. So we understand what's available to students, and we're making decisions about their readiness to be in our college environments based on the uniqueness of their skills and abilities. In terms of um, someone else offered, how can you prepare for the SAT? And um, I would just say, I think Khan Academy is a great free resource for that, and they have been for a while. Um, but you also now have, I think, a much richer opportunity to think about the application process in a test optional format. Some schools will be adding criteria like additional writing samples or additional information they want to their application. So just to be focused on the application itself and what the school is looking for in terms of other criteria that they may want you to submit to help get a richer sense of who you are as a student. And just remember that we're all here just friendly faces looking for ways to help you through this process. So um, while it seems intimidating and really a little bit scary, I think all of us um, that are in the admission world are just looking for ways to be incredibly flexible and supportive of our student applicants. Glendale, I see you wanting to chime in. Let me give you a chance to. Um, yeah, I would just say, I mean, Shannon hit the nail right on the head with her comments about um, the holistic review. And, you know, the SAT and ACT has always and will always be just one piece of the puzzle as to what we look, uh, look at and as to what makes you who you are as a student and what you bring to these different institutions. Um, with that being said, the University of Washington will not require the SAT for students entering um, autumn 2021. Um, but again, there's so much more that makes you who you are as a person and student, um, your personal achievements, your leadership qualities. Uh, and so it wasn't always just heavily, so heavily focused on the SAT, although we are trying to make it easier for students. And so we have uh, took a look at that and said we will not require that for autumn 2021. Fred, can I pop in with a question really quick? You bet, Andrews. 
So one question that came up with uh, that came up on our question and answer here was um, with the the leniency being shown for the um, incoming group of of students to universities, will that continue on for the next three or four years so that our sophomores and, and freshmen will also experience that? Very likely, uh, you are really seeing on the national media and the industry news and even making into very, very prominent news outlets, New York Times, Chronicle of Higher Education, just to name a couple, that colleges and universities are making now long-term decisions about their policies associated with uh, taking of, oh, excuse me, of utilizing the test scores of the ACT or SAT, even the TOEFL for students who are international. Uh, it goes beyond just those two exams to make those not required at all or not even used. Uh, it really comes down to a commitment to access uh, and recognizing that, that, that some of these uh, challenges that we're seeing are, are keeping a disproportionately affecting certain populations. And it really caused the industry to take a moment of pause and realize to what extent we were disproportionately utilizing this one metric into this holistic review experience that we often like to promote and espouse. So uh, in many respects, uh, this is gonna be the right choice for a lot of institutions, very prominent ones. You talk about Cornell University, you talk about Vassar, you talk about University of Washington that are looking at making these decisions probably temporarily for the next two years, so 2021, but for those sophomores and first years freshmen who might be coming in, eighth graders, rising freshmen, I would really stay uh, in touch with your school guidance office to figure out what the industry trends are gonna be like over the next couple of years. And kind of rounding this out, uh, Susie Henderson or, or Vicki, just things that you are on your mind about ways we'll be supporting our juniors and our sophomores, our freshmen, um, as they go through this process. Um, this is Vicki. I guess what I'd like to say is that um, a few things that we're asking our students to do right now, currently, is while we are on this alternative grading system of A, or um, incomplete, um, we want students to do their very, very best because we know that even next year, going into next year, they're gonna need the skill sets to be able to get into the next level of class. And students going off to college, they're gonna need those skill sets to go off to college with, to get started in college. And granted, the college uh, um, um, colleagues here tonight have said that they're gonna give some grace. Um, our students still need to be prepared and um, they might not necessarily be prepared if they're not giving it their best effort. Um, so that's one thing I just wanted to point it out to our students and our families that are listening. I think for juniors um, and, and sophomores, freshmen, um, again, we are, our counseling staff is working very hard with them to help them set up schedules that are gonna help them be successful next year. We are looking into the fall, leaning into that, knowing that the unknown being we don't know what our schools are gonna look like in the fall, but we definitely know back to what Dina and Brian said earlier, that we're gonna be preparing students um, and starting them in a different place than we normally would um, to, to get set and get ready to go after the learning that, that they would normally go after. So I guess the biggest advice that I would have for, our, especially if our parents are listening tonight is, um, to, to, to sit down and have a real, real direct conversation with their student about giving it their best effort. Because I think as our college admissions um, folks have shared, they've said that they're looking at the, the whole child, the well-roundedness of the child. They're not just looking at test scores and they're not just looking at individual things. And so they're gonna look at trends uh, on the transcript, I suspect, and see um, what's going on there. So um, I guess that's what I would like to share. And then I think the other piece is the anxiety level which our students are feeling. Um, one thing that could be really helpful is, is if our families can also um, spend the time listening to their students and helping their students to get over this hurdle because if we are experiencing anxiety, we the adults are, then certainly our students are feeling that too. And um, anything we can do on the social emotional side to help support them through this time, um, I think is really, really critical. Um, Henderson or Susie, did you want to share anything more? I think it's just really important. Vicki, what you said, I think is what I've been trying to say is we really have to address that piece. Um, we're working really hard in the counseling center on 
information about the evolving post high school options. I don't want to say I'm getting hundreds of emails because I haven't counted them all, but I know that I'm getting heaps of emails from universities and colleges and they really are going to be looking at that 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 freshman in high school and on up as things change because there's no way at this point to really know where we're going to be a year or two years from now. And the best thing we could, can do for our kids is to help them learn to be a little bit more adaptable and to breathe and to know that it's going to be okay. I think Dina, we were in a meeting earlier and you said something wonderful when you said, now correct me if I'm wrong, but you said you can't be, okay, I'm gonna get it wrong. You can't be behind if nobody's ahead you can't be behind if nobody's ahead of you and we're all exactly in the same situation. Yes. So there's no one moving forward as you're sitting there falling behind. Yeah. So I think we need to, yes, I it was just so perfect when you said it. And I think we just, we, we need to listen to what these wonderful people from higher ed are saying and what some of the other organizations are saying and really work on just the, that anxiety and making sure that our kids understand and help them learn to be more adaptable. I think sometimes our kids are very, they're so anxious all the time and they're so entrenched and we need to say it's going to be okay and things are just going to keep changing and we're all struggling with that. So and I, and I just like, I just like to add to that. Um, it's definitely a super majority of all of the students that I'm working with um, through my classes that are doing everything that they're supposed to be doing. These are good kids and they're working really hard. And I know they're in situations that are very difficult and um, it's very impressive how hard they're working and doing all their work. And I'd like to commend all the students out there um, for all the hard work in such a difficult situation. You're doing a great job. Henderson. So I think it's really just want to echo what Vicki said and Brian and Dina is that there will definitely be some curriculum adjustment in the fall, depending on where students are. Students may see more uh, beginning of the year assessment so we can identify gaps and areas that we need to shore up as, as they move into the curriculum. Um, my concern is more the social emotional piece because our students, our district, um, our students want it so bad, they work so hard, and that next year may be a little harder for some students because um, they're coming from eight weeks of online and things may not come as easy as they normally have. And so making sure that we have the supports in the building um, that can help alleviate some of that stress. So there's gonna be those conversations that counselors are having about scheduling and about balance. Um, I know we're gonna be looking at the supports we offer our support system and what do we have to do because we're gonna to have to beef it up, I think, because um, of the situation that we're in. So, you know, whether that's the tutoring, whether that's the advisory where we're doing more, um, our Islander Hour where we're doing more um, social emotional there and uh, giving our students an outlet. But uh, we're prepared for it. We will be prepared because we're already looking at what does that fall look like? And I think the teachers understand that they're not going to start in September where they start every September. And that's the important thing to make sure that we fill the gaps and, and create a strong foundation as they move forward. Great. Lori, did I see a hand go up before looking for, you know, kindergarten lens? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's just really important for us to remember that if during a global crisis, we have the luxury to worry about an education, it means our other basic needs are met. And that's not true for everyone experiencing this time. And so with that, if that's the thing that our kids learn is that they are so blessed that they have enough to eat. And if they don't, we've got a school district that's got breakfast and lunch for them. And they've got all of these adults, their parents, their school, everyone cares about them and wants them just the best for them. If there's a little roughing up, then there's some disappointments and some adversity, then that's good for our kids, in my opinion. It's okay to have things be 
not always the way you want them because it makes us stronger. And I think that's a good lesson to learn. Leaning into the middle school for just a second, kind of coming back to, to Drew and, and Mary Jo, can you give us a little bit of a behind the scenes look at what do teachers typically do or what will they be doing to get a sense of, you know, where did, um, you know, the English language arts, uh, the ELA classes leave off in sixth grade, going to seventh grade, how will that be determined about where they're going to pick up? Are there different ways that student that students are assessed? Um, obviously, didn't have the SBA, which is global anyway, but a little behind the scenes look at what does that look like teacher to teacher, department to department? Well, um, like I said earlier in the meeting, our um, departments are working super closely together and we are um, also talking about that alignment, that six to seven, that seven to eight. And so our teachers are going to be spending time together thinking about what, you know, talking about those essential standards, talking about where they were emphasizing what pieces they decided to move away from and which ones they decided to um, focus in on so that the next year's teacher knows where to start. Um, but we also do lots Lots of assessing of kids in formative ways. Kids will do writing pieces that we will use as a stepping off point because whether kids missed or didn't miss, they're still going to all come in in a variety of places. And our teachers are very skilled in their ability to assess where kids are and to move all kids forward at, at the pace that works best for them. Anyone else want to add on to that? Just ways that teachers get to know their students at the beginning of the year in a typical year and what might be different this year? I think in a typical year, we do, um, we do kind of assessments in the beginning anyways to see where they're at. But um, um, we, like I said, I know for a fact that all the, all the departments are talking regularly about um, these are, these are what I really want them to know, but oh, this and this and this, I usually teach them is great. Um, maybe you can do a mini unit on that in the fall um, when, when, you re when you do the extra review. And so I think that um, um, we all, we're all gonna have to just relax a little bit and know that um, there will be a thing or two maybe that they missed, but I think that you know, they will be ready for what they need to be ready for. Um, we'll make sure of it. Chris. I think um, just to echo on the top of that from a younger standpoint, um, the, the way that something that's happened in the elementaries is um, there's a, this term called siloed where every building is unto itself and all those teachers talk just to each other. And um, there's also something called uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And, and in the last two months, I have probably gotten to know more teachers from other schools and it's been nothing but good. Um, I think that we've gotten more efficient at figuring out who needs what, and we've gotten better at supporting each other in whatever we're trying to do for the kids. And I think that part of what I do for kids now is um, differentiate to a degree that I've never differentiated before. I'm a lot more flexible with what I allow them to do in order to meet the standard. So if they need to tell me what it is, they tell me. If they need to do it in another way, I let them go there. But the beauty of that is I'm meeting with them five at a time. So I can do that. And I couldn't do that before. Brian. Yeah, I would echo, echo the last few things that were said. We're going to come out of this stronger as a district. There's a lot more collaboration with teachers, a lot more consistency. There is a lot more flexibility in um, providing equity of access to students, um, and not just our special needs students, but all students. And I think um, we're, we're, we're moving ahead, and we're going to be stronger. Great. Before I kind of move into our last segment, Andrew, is anything coming in on the chat that we want to make sure that we capture or that we um, address? Yes, um, there was just some clarifying questions. I think we can answer uh, fairly quickly. Um, 
for our college um, admissions officers on the call, um, you had mentioned um, not necessarily looking at those college test scores. There was some question about whether that was for both the ACT and the SAT. Can you just clarify, are, are they not looking at both of those scores or? Yeah, it's both for you, Doug. Okay. And then there was one question that, that came up that was um, intriguing. Um, where one of Andrew, our hold on one second. Let me let uh, UPS and Western Washington answer that. Uh, were tests optional for all tests? Let's make sure that folks understand that for schools that oftentimes express that they are test optional, that means that they would have the option of sending either the ACT or the SAT, uh, or not at all. And for schools that are moving towards the test blind category, again, there's a bit nuanced in the language. That means that the student may send it, but it will not be used in some of the processes associated with admissions. And even in some, ca some cases, depending on the school, even with the awarding of merit scholarships. So uh, higher ed is one of those interesting beasts where there are so many colleges and universities, over 4,000 of them, each doing a slightly different thing but there is growing momentum in this national movement out there to really uh, do away more and more with standardized testing or the weight of it in the process. Great, thanks. All right, Andrews. And then another question that, that came up on here is for those students who have taken either the ACT or the SAT um, and are very happy with their score and, and feel good about it, um, what, can you, what can you tell those families or those students in regards to how that would be um, used to, to judge admission. Um, will that be dismissed or is that still a consideration? The beauty of holistic review is that we can use all of those factors, right? If a student was really excelled and did great on the test, that's a very positive indicator for us. And we can say, wonderful, this helps contribute to the broader overall picture of this student. Um, and for the students that choose not to submit a test score and to either show other indicators or to have us look at other factors in their application, that's wonderful too. It allows us to just really assess students across all of those factors. Um, tests, I think, really are just confirmation of what we're seeing on in GPA and in course rigor. It's an understanding that what we're seeing there is accurate and it helps validate that information. And, um, so by doing well on that test, it helps to validate what we're typically seeing um, in a student's grades. Well put. That was awesome. Glendale, do you want to add anything? No, Shannon's killing it. That's why she's one of my mentors. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And Dreams, anything else before I go to the panelists for some final thoughts? Go ahead. I think go ahead and go to final thoughts. I'm going to um, capture the Q&A and share that Great. with you afterwards. Okay, thank you. Um, we're kind of hitting on it at the thing. end there. Oh, go ahead, Vicki. Um, you know, there was one parent who mentioned something that I think is really important for all of us to remember. Um, and I just appreciate the parent taking the time to say this. Um, the parent mentioned that um, she had, the, the, he or she had children in all three levels and um, the expectations of, for, from, from the teaching side are she she felt she or he felt was a little high and that English was not this person's first language and so it makes it more challenging to homeschool their students right now so I just wanted to applaud that parent for sharing that it's uh it's information that we as educators need to continue to be thinking about equitable so support for our students across the board so whoever this parent is I just want to say thank you for mentioning that uh, your point is well taken. And as Superintendent Colossi opened with, um, as we're planning for next year, and we don't know if we will be back in our schools um, or if we will be in a hybrid model or if we will be in remote learning again, um, we will be reaching out to our students and our families to um, seek feedback in forums like this or surveys um, so we can continue to plan forward uh, grow, learn, and adapt uh, as we fail forward uh, in some ways and succeed forward in others. So, uh, Vicki, thanks for raising that. Some, some parting uh, words, and, and panelists, if you don't anymore, that's perfectly fine, too. You were starting to go there at the beginning. 
And I, I guess um, two questions and take them wherever you want. Either what gives you hope in this in terms of education or what are you experiencing as an educator or educator that maybe we weren't doing before, but you want to hang on to and make sure we don't lose. And we reopen uh, our doors, all whatever that might look like. Lori, start with kindergarten and we'll work our way up. Or down, maybe <laughs> kindergarten's the top. <laughs> Um, the thing that I am uh, just most impressed with above all else is the work ethic of my parents, the kids, and the staff with whom I work. We're a small community, but I don't think we've ever been a tighter community. The partnership that I have with my parents is like nothing I've ever had before. With kindergartners, they can't access that learning grid unless someone lets them have the iPad, right? They can't read. Well, some of them can. But the, I think it's now more than ever before, without the partnership of my parents, education stops. And I am beyond grateful for them. And so I hope in whatever way we move forward, I've got all 20 of them, 40 of them, right next to me. And Chris? Um, I, I want to go back to Vicki's comment because it, I think it rings so um, poignantly and so uh, critically for that parent to reach out um, because teachers have support and they can offer the support, especially to that elementary student. I, I mean, that's what I know. And there are people who are waiting to give that support to that student. So that'd be my first thought. And then um, to echo what Lori said, um, I think we're working better than we've ever worked. And uh, it's really amazing. The, the piece that is the hardest for teachers is the up close and personal relationship. And that is just, I mean, it's, it's the, heartbreaking part of all of this. And I think that when we come back, that's going to be what is so amazingly precious to all of us. So. Drew? Um, I think what gives me uh, hope is that um, these kids are still reaching out. So at the middle level, they are still reaching out to all of their counselors and their teachers, and they want that personal connection, and they are truly showing resiliency. And I'm just so proud of our community, our parents, our teachers, and our kids, but it's the kids are our focus. And I, I also think that this is going to push kids to ask more questions and our perfectionist kids that never want to show that they're they're wrong you know or they don't know um i think that this is going to help them learn to ask more questions and to be more vulnerable um so i just you know i'm just so incredibly impressed with everything that this entire community has done so that gives me all the hope in, in the world. All right, Joe, you want to add any more? I mean, Drew said that pretty beautifully, um, as did our elementary colleagues. I, I have hope because of the good that I see in everybody through these really hard times. I see people reaching out to one another, supporting each other, asking for help when needed, um, being flexible and, and resilient, as Drew was saying. Our kids are truly amazing. And I miss that interaction every day in the halls that I, get, I used to get with them and at lunch and how they made me laugh. But I know they're doing that with their teachers and their um, Zoom conversations and, and through our counseling office hours. And, and so I'm just, I really have so much hope. And the thing that I hope that carries over into next year is the variety that I'm seeing in our in our teaching strategies. And our teachers are truly considering a variety of pathways for kids. And, you know, I heard Chris talking about this specifically at the elementary level too, but just really considering that 
every kid doesn't need to look the same and every kid doesn't have to go down the same learning pathway and can be at different stages. And our teachers are being so flexible and so adaptable to what those needs are right now. And I really um, look forward to seeing that translate as we come back into a brick and mortar situation, whenever that might be. High school, I'll just open it up a blanket to all of you. So I had the pleasure of visiting uh, six classrooms within the last uh, Friday and Monday. And I, I was really hopeful um, seeing all the creativity, the flexibility, the um, adapting to equity of access, to the planning and the um, willingness to fail um, with, through our t within our teaching staff. And it, it, that gave me hope. Um, it was a very hopeful day for the last two days. I think that um, we're definitely, as a school, more organized on Schoology because of this. So I think that it's been a, a really great boost um, for technology uh, for our teachers. And um, the other thing I was saying earlier, and um, we don't have this all figured out, but I know that when I um, survey my kids about 20 to 20 to 30 percent of them really prefer the online learning to the brick and mortar and if we can somehow um, I don't know do a hybrid or something where um, it, it, it kind of supports those kids that prefer that and do better in that situation um, that would be definitely something for us to explore um, and grow in that direction in the fall um, and learn something from all this that would be great I think we've all learned a lot about ourselves, our students as learners, um, us as parents, um, us as teachers, uh, professionals, whatever walk of life you're in, we've all learned us at a deeper level. And just some of the things that, you know, we didn't think we could do that we're doing or, or just whatever it is, but it's made us more in tune to our skills. And I think that's going to help students moving forward. The, it's, they've been talking about the, the resilience, the perseverance, um, that they are all had to change. They had to change learning platforms. They had to change learning environments and did, don't have the support that they maybe had in schools, and yet they're, they're getting through it. And as, as a district, we understand this is not working for everyone, and we're going to be ready to to catch and catch those students when they come in and hug them and and, and try to get them back on track. But definitely, I think we've all learned a lot more about it ourselves than we probably knew before. Great. And our friends in higher ed. I can go ahead and <laughs> go first though. I just think that in times of uncertainty, it's really important to remember that these processes have to be extremely relational. And I've heard so many stories and learned about so many different people and I've celebrated with students, you know, and comforted students. And so I think more so than it being a, a process of educational success, I mean, it's been a process of life and growth and those two things aren't mutually exclusive of each other. And so to continue to build those relationships with each other, I think has given me a lot of hope. With that being said, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me and email me. I guess I'm going to Yeah, thank you. Uh, Shannon can go last. Um, we, we all became a little bit less invisible. We have not, we have changed relationships with our technology, with our work, with our peers, with our planet, with our own bodies in many respects, right? You know, the handing, washing hands and being aware of where we are in a social space or physical world. And with that, we also recognize the other as being perhaps a bit less invisible too. And what a, what a humbling experience it's been to, to process that. So that gives me a great deal of hope that the interconnectedness can just be strengthened from here on out. And Shannon. Because I don't think I'm quite as inspirational as Glendale or Cesar, I will just say that as I look through the question and answer um, chat, what I notice is a ton of questions about test scores. Just remember test scores don't define you. The whole of your application defines you. 
So I see a lot of people, at least as those questions, my interpretation is freaking out a little about test scores, let that go. Just know that seniors, we're gonna be flexible with you um, through this process and that we're adapting and growing to and finding all the best ways to support you. For high school freshmen, sophomores, juniors, we know and are not going to forget that the pandemic of 2020 happened and we are going to account for that when we review your applications in the future. And we'll do that with flexibility and grace. So just remember that. And high school juniors, now is a pretty amazing time to be doing college searches. The amount of online and virtual content available for you to explore colleges and universities at your leisure is huge. Take advantage of that. Start making your list. Start thinking ahead so that when it's time for you to visit campuses in person and you can actually do that, you're ready and prepared for that. And you can start answering some of your own questions about what schools are touched optional because you've unpacked what schools are right fits for you. And then you can start looking at what their requirements are. The last thing I will note, just because I thought it was a really um, important question, is just about the financial help and um, stability of colleges and universities right now. Um, I would say we all have our different answers to that and that's not applicable just to small private institutions. Large public institutions will have probably equally sized budget reductions that need to be made um, and that will impact students. But I will say we are all, um, I think in a position where we're ready to make that adaptation and we're doing it um, with our students' best interest at heart and best interest um, at, at, at hand. So um, if anyone wants to follow up on any of these questions with me, um, I'm happy to um, be contacted by email. And I think Fred, I don't know if you'll be sending that out to participants or not, but happy to be a resource if you, if you need and want that. Great. Uh, Donna, a closing thought from you and then I'll wrap it up. I will be very brief. And um, what gives me hope is, um, our students, our kids, um, and the, um, the mission that we have in our value statement of students are the priority and that we have a real commitment to educating the whole child. And that was so evident among this group today. So um, as an educator, what do I want to hold on to is um, this group and so many more across our district who are so dedicated to um, serving our students and serving our community. So thank you to each of you. You certainly um, give me hope and I know that we are going to grow and always strive to get better at this work we're doing, especially as it keeps shifting a little bit underneath us, but um, we're doing this together. So thank you all very much. And I wanna thank, uh, at times we had over 200 participants who were observing tonight, uh, joining us and, and uh, I think it speaks to the investment uh, that many of you touched on tonight. Um, I certainly also want to thank all of you as panelists for giving up time this evening uh, to share your perspectives on education, uh, keeping the focus on our students. We will have future fireside ch uh, chat topics. Andrew Reeves Ronzer, who's on tonight, is working on um, a series of recordings on for families on how to manage um, your online media at home. Uh, especially parental controls offered through Xfinity and other providers to help you parents. Um, we'll have another series on uh, mental health and supporting behavior challenges you might be seeing in your home uh, that not have seen before. And then we'll begin some of the conversation too, based on the chat that we weren't able to get to tonight, as well as ones that came in uh, via the Google form. I know that um, we certainly wanna continue reaching out and hearing where we're not doing as well. We know we're oftentimes compared to the charter schools, independent schools, um, private schools, and other public schools. We are learning each and every day and trying to uh, get the very best from all of our colleagues across the state and country to learn and, and to continue to prepare for here. But those will be future fireside chart conversations. So as my final year, uh, I'm getting much cooler, which is great. Uh, we want to thank all of you for participating tonight. Um, whether you're home as an observer or our panelists, it really is what a great community we have. And your three guests from higher ed, thank you for sharing perspectives from your um, respective universities. So for tonight, we will sign off. Thank you so much for joining and have a great night.